Good morning again. I want to make just a few announcements this morning. First of all, I want to give you an update on Jim. Jim is expected back to work on Tuesday, and we'll be glad to welcome him back. Um, closely related to that, we are still in need, despite Jim's return, in the need of sound booth uh, volunteers. Uh, as we've learned, we kind of need some, some shoring up in that area. Uh, so if, and, and so the qualifications are two. Uh, you have to have fingers, and you have to be able to stay awake for the whole service. Um, and and, and uh, <coughs> when Don has fingers, let's see if he stays awake. So we'll, we'll see. Um, and, but if you are interested in helping, there will be a brief training session uh, after each worship service next Sunday. I was planning on leading that. I will be here, uh, but hopefully Jim will also be a part of leading that as well. Um, so we hope that if you're in for me, uh, you, you join us for, for those times. Um, also, in terms of, of uh, needing people, uh, we are looking for uh, people for the celebration band, both vocalist and instrumentalist. If you're interested, you can contact Joe. Uh, and then uh, Handbell Choir and Chancel Choir are, are starting back up for the fall, beginning uh, Wednesday, August 24th. New members are welcome in contact Dan. And then uh, lastly, I want to make sure you have on your calendars our fall kickoff Sunday for August 28th. Uh, we'll have a single worship service at 10 o'clock, and then we will have uh, followed by a meal and some activities over at the Family Life Center. And we want to thank Mike Diestrich, he got our air conditioner running. So, our backup air conditioner running. So, uh, we do have some, there's some air flowing in here, so uh, we're thankful for that. Uh, and now, with joy and thanksgiving, let us offer our gifts to God.
Let us pray. Almighty God, giver of every good and perfect gift, we give thanks to you for all the gifts that you have given to us. And in praise and thanksgiving, we offer our gifts to you. Bless the givers and the gifts and those who have not to give. Use our gifts and us to do your work in the world, to spread your gospel throughout the earth, and to bring glory to your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. For the song, we will I'll read the we'll read that responsively. I will read the light type, uh, you will read the bull type, and we will sing uh, the response together with the men's choir. with loud shouts. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. of the sea as in a bottle, and put the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in love. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. For the Lord spoke, and it came to be. The Lord commanded, and it stood forth. of the Lord stands forever, the thoughts of God's heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom the Lord has chosen as their heritage. Sees all peoples. The Lord is from the sword on all the inhabitants of the earth, fashioning the hearts of them all, and answering all their deeds. A king is not saved by his great army, a warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war forces the people. steadfast love, to deliver their souls from death, and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul is the Lord, who is our help and shield. Our heart is glad in the Lord, because we trust in God's holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us.
if this is your first time here worshiping with us at Wesley, uh, we'd ask that you'd see an usher. We do have a gift for you. Hello. Well, to, today, I, for our children's sermon, I have a very special guest, yes. but I couldn't bring her with me today, and so I have a video. Hi, this is Lumi. This is my daughter's dog. She's a 10 month old Shiva Inu, and she's a pretty good dog. She's almost completely potty trained. That's why we bring her to church, because she's almost completely potty trained. But you'll notice she has a leash. And the reason she has this leash is to keep her safe, because if she didn't have this leash, she would uh, chase squirrels and chase rabbits and run the traffic and do all kinds of things that might get her hurt. But one day we're hoping that she'll learn and she'll grow up and she'll learn to calm and stay, and maybe she won't need to leash so much anymore. And I think that's true of us as kids too, because when we're little kids, we have a lot of rules that big kids don't have. And that's, of course, just like this leash is supposed to keep us safe. And our relationship with God is like that too. When we first become a Christian, we may feel like there's a bunch of rules and we maybe don't even know why there's all these rules or what they're for. But as we, we learn and we grow, we learn that, that God's rules are all about keeping us safe. And as we grow and as we mature, it's, it's less about having to obey the rules, or like having a leash, and it's more about uh, doing what God wants us to do because we want to please God. Just like I know Rumi wants to learn and be trained and please us. So, just remember, even though the rules seem like they don't make sense sometimes, they're there to keep us safe, and one day we'll grow up to appreciate them. Would you pray with me? Dear God, help us to learn to obey you, not because we want to, not because we have to, but because we want to. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 2, verses 16 through 23. Listen to the word of God. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what the things they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection through the, with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body but they lack any value in restraining sexual indulgence. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we are continuing in our series in the book of Colossians called in Christ alone, in Christ alone. And we are uh, discussing the, 
Our topic is the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ, that Christ is the best and that Christ is enough. This is in contrast to the heresies that had emerged in, um, in the Colossian church, uh, which we've kind of summarized as Christ and. Like, you need Christ, but you also need this, this Greek philosophy in the form of Gnosticism, or you need uh, this Jewish ritual. Uh, and so remember that we, we talked about the Gnostics, who, who was from the Greek word for knowledge, who, who had secret knowledge, and they were hyper-mystical, and they rejected the body. They thought the body was bad, and that the, the, the secret was is that we are actually spirits trapped inside bodies, and of course, that's not Christian doctrine. We are, we are spirits, but our bodies and our spirits are redeemed through Christ. Uh, and of course, then you have, on the other hand, you have people who were trying to pursue the Jewish rituals, the thinking being, and you see this throughout the New Testament, being refuted all over the place, that, that Jesus was a Jew, the apostles were Jews, and so if you were going to be a real Christian, you had to become Jewish first and observe all of that. And so that, that's what we're, we're dealing with throughout this passage, and, and uh, Colossians is going to take us through the end of August, just to let you know. Uh, so Paul is still working through the rejection of Gnosticism and ritualism. Paul is still working through that rejection of both Gnosticism and ritualism. And so he's going to take on, first of all, um, this Jewish ritualism. Paul says, do not let anyone judge you based on the menu or the calendar. Don't let anyone judge you based on the menu or the calendar. Now, I need you to know we're Methodists. About every meeting we have, those are the two topics of conversation, the menu and the calendar. When are we going to meet, and when are we going to eat when we get there, right? Does that sound like a Methodist meeting to anybody? Yeah, yeah. The, the, we're, 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 we're fixated around the menu and the calendar. But what Paul meant by this was that that there were people in Colossae who were trying to spread the false gospel that you had to observe all the religious, first of all, the, the dietary laws, you had to be kosher, right? No, no bacon and no shrimp. And bacon wrapped shrimp was a double no-no, right? <laughs> so, 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 um, and uh, you had to keep kosher and you had to observe all these, the minutia of all these, these festivals and Sabbath rules, and remember how much trouble Jesus had with the Sabbath, right? He, he was healing people on the Sabbath, and people didn't like that because they had created all these rules. Yes, God said, take a day off, but, but when God said, take a day off, they created a bunch of rules about things you couldn't do on your day off, and, and the church really hasn't gotten rid of that. Um, how many of you ever heard of the English Civil War? Charles, King Charles I and Oliver Cromwell? Does that ring a bell? Uh, well, actually, uh, one, of the, one of the things that precipitated the English Civil War is that King Charles I wrote something called the Book of Sports. And he, he encouraged people to go to church on Sunday, and after, after church, then you could go out and you could play, I don't know, croquet, cricket, yeah, I don't know what games they had back then. But, you know, Sunday morning church, then Sunday afternoon you can go play golf, right? And Oliver Cromwell and the Puritans lost their stake in mind, right? So much so that they started a war, ended up deposing uh, King Charles, and, and eventually King Charles lost his head over the deal, right? Literally lost his head over, over the deal. Um, so, you know, we haven't got very far from that. It is having all... Having good things, having having good rules, and then we start making rules about the rules. And that's when we start getting into trouble, is when we start making rules about the rules. And and we see that even today. Like like we 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 Methodists, like a large part of the body of Christ, we worship with a calendar. We have things like Advent and Lent and, and, and those kind of things. But but for Methodists anyway, when it gets to be around Lent, I'll stand up here and tell you that you should find a Lent discipline, that you should find something that you're going to do during Lent, you should maybe think about giving up something for Lent, but I leave that all up to you, 
right? I don't, we don't require that and we don't require something specific because we think that would be kind of beyond the, the, the bounds of what, what scripture would have us uh, do together to create those kind of rules for one another. Other, other communities choose to engage in a community discipline where they all agree to do the same thing. But the point is, is don't let anybody judge you over that stuff. Don't let anybody judge you. You know, my, you know, if you didn't eat anchovies on St. Aloysius Day, I just made that up. <laughs> I know we've got some Catholics here, but I just made that up. I'll be honest, I just made that up. But if you didn't eat anchovies on St. Aloysius Day, you're not, don't, don't, don't judge people over stuff like that. Don't let anyone judge you, and don't you judge anyone. But now he's going to shift gears. He's going to move away from the ritualists back to the Gnostic. He says, don't let anyone judge you based on secret knowledge and hyper-mysticism. Don't let anybody judge you based on secret knowledge and hyper-mysticism. Because these are, the, these are the, the, the real people that talk about, you know, I... I, you know, they, they want to share all the time about some kind of spiritual experience they've had, and if they've had a better or, or nicer spiritual experience than you, then they're a better Christian than you. Don't let anybody judge you based on that. Because the secret is, as I told you time and time again, the secret is that there is no secret. God is fully revealed in Scripture. God is fully revealed in Scripture. There is no secret. Paul says that those who get caught up in these things, and I think by these things he means both the ritualism and the Gnosticism, both the ritualism and the philosophy, those who get caught up in these things have lost connection with the head, which is Christ. So if, if Christ is supposed to be our head and Christ alone, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, it's almost as if you get the picture of they're disconnecting from, from Christ and trying to plug in to one of these other things. And of course, that's not going to get them anywhere good. Now to explain this next little bit, I need to, I need to back up a little bit and, and say that there were, two, there were two ways Gnosticism was practiced primarily in the Greek world. Right? Remember, Gnosticism is a rejection of the body. The body is bad. In fact, the body doesn't matter. In fact, in some cases, they went so far to say that the body is a delusion. That we're only imagining that we have, we have bodies. Right? We're, we're deceived. We're not just trapped, we're deceived. Our bodies aren't real. Um, and so people took that two very different directions. Stoicism and Epicureanism, you may recognize those words the way we use them in English, which aren't completely unrelated to the way that we were used in Greek. So the Epicureans were the eat, drink, and be merry type, right? The body doesn't matter. Not only does the body not matter, the body's not even really real. And so, doesn't matter what you do with it. Eat, drink, and be merry, enjoy yourself, have a good time. Um, and, and if you want to learn about them, they're in there in Corinth. So in 1 and 2 Corinthians, you can see that. Um, and so you've heard that the body is a temple. Uh, for, the, for the Epicureans, the body was a brothel. Right? Just do whatever you want. Uh, because it doesn't matter. The Stoics, on the other hand, which is what appears to be going on in Colossae, which we'll see in a minute, the, the Stoics said, um, you know, you need to discipline the body, right? You need to you need to squash the body down. You need to oppress the body and discipline the body so it doesn't interfere with your spiritual life, right? And so, not just the idea like we would practice Christian fasting and abstinence uh, as a spiritual discipline. They they would be really severe about that. You've got to control the body. So basically, that's it. Uh, Epicurean, let the body run out of control because it doesn't matter. Stoic, control the body absolutely uh, so it doesn't interfere with your spiritual life. Those are your, those are your two choices. And that's what Paul's getting into. And so he, he says, why do you submit to these, these worldly rules, these human rules? Do not, do not handle, do not touch, do not taste. Now, me, from the time I grew up, I can't read that passage without thinking I have see hammer. Can't touch this. Dun, 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 dun. Right? I, you know, that's what goes through my head. 
<laughs> but, but this idea of you, you can't, you, you've got to separate yourself from, from all of this. And what Paul wants to say is that these external disciplines, these external disciplines may seem wise, but they do not always produce internal holiness. And so where do we see that in the body of Christ today? Well, there's some churches in the holiness tradition, and we're United Methodists, we're part of the holiness tradition, but some churches that have taken that a step further and maybe spun off of Methodism, you know, you'll, you'll go to church and, and everybody's wearing long sleeves, all the ladies are wearing long dresses, all the men have short hair, all the ladies have long hair, and you know, in some cases there's no jewelry, no makeup, right? Uh, th these are all regulations that they put in place and, and they're talking about modesty usually, or at least, uh, you know, modesty both, you know, in all these forms. But they bring rules about the rules. And, and the reason I think that we do that is it's a lot easier for me to be, for me to um, make sure that my sleeve's the right length, to make sure that my hair's the right length, than it is for me to make sure or to check on the condition of my heart. Because you can have long sleeves and you can still have you can still have selfishness. You can have long sleeves and still have gossip. You can say, you know, it's the deeper matters of the heart that I think we want to avoid by by buying into some of this other stuff. I, I heard one time somebody uh, say that many times at Christian schools, just like a public school, just with longer short, longer skirts and shorter haircuts. Right? It's not helpful. It, because it doesn't change the inside. So all of this is to bring us to the point of freedom. All of this is to bring us to this concept of freedom. What does it mean to be free in Christ? Freedom in Christ means that we are free to follow and obey Christ. Not because we have to, but because we want to, because we're free to it. Because most of the time, if you said if you said freedom, people would think that um, freedom means doing what you want, doing whatever you want. How many people here have spent some time in their life doing whatever they wanted? How many people here would admit that I spent some time in my life doing whatever I wanted? Did that lead to freedom? No, right? Yeah, some of us have a past. The, the root word for pastor is past. I don't know if you know that. But, but um, you know, we know that that's not freedom. We know, we know that ultimately doing what we want just makes us slaves to ourselves. Right? You're going to serve somebody. Right? Wise man once said that. You're going to serve somebody. You might serve yourself. But I served myself for, for many years as a young adult, and I found out that I'm a terrible master. You're going to serve somebody. But when we turn to serve Christ, in Him, we find freedom. Just like my daughter's dog, Bloomy. I can't stress that enough. My daughter's dog, Bloomy, would probably think that us letting her out of the house without her leash would be freedom. But what would be the result? We think the same way. We want to be free, but we know that only in Christ can we find true freedom. Brothers and sisters, we are free in Christ. In Christ alone. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the true freedom that you give us in Christ. God, freedom, freedom from our sin, freedom from ritual, freedom from philosophy, freedom from ourselves. God, we, we, we can no longer stand to serve ourselves because we are horrible masters. God, and we want to stop serving ourselves. We want to stop being slaves to ourselves. And we want to come and serve you where we will find true freedom. 
God, a freedom that, that is not just a free for all, but a freedom that actually helps us grow and prosper and flourish. God, we pray for this church. We pray that you bless us and help us to grow and prosper. Help us to worship and serve you in spirit and in truth and serve the world in your name. God, we pray for the whole body of Christ throughout the world. We pray for the persecuted church. We pray for the United Methodist Church, for this annual conference, and our Bishop Lori, her continued recovery, and our, and our Bishop Deb. We pray for this district and our superintendent, Doug. We pray for our community, our nation, and our world in these troubled times. God, we pray for all those that are sick or in need. God, we continue to pray for Jim. We pray for Kay. God, we pray for High Rise United Methodist Church um, as they're preparing to, to, to build, but um, that's on hold right now because uh, they're in the middle of a contentious and, and even potentially violent election season there. God, we just pray for, for peaceful elections and a peaceful transition of power for our brothers and sisters in, in Kenya. God, we pray for the men and women who serve us at home and abroad. We pray for our local leaders at every level. We pray for ourselves, our families, our church, our community, our nation, and our world in these troubled times. And God, we pray, pray for peace and justice and health and freedom and stability and prosperity and holiness. And now, oh God, we pray that you would hear the prayers of each and every heart that are worshiping with us today, either at home or online, as we lift up our prayers to you either silently or aloud, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, you've heard our prayers here this morning, and you hear the prayers that remain silent upon our hearts. Oh God, you know our every need, and when we do not know how to pray, your spirit intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. And God, we pray that you hear us now as we lift our voices together in the prayer which our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please stand and join me in professing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We will receive communion as we have um, here recently. Uh, if you would come down the center aisle, I'll offer you a wafer that you can then receive and then step to either side. And there'll be a servant that will hand you a cup that you can then receive. And then there is a waste basket at either side before you return to the center aisle for those empty cups. 
Dear friends, United Methodist Church practices open communion. Christ our Lord invites to his table all those who truly love him, all those who earnestly repent of their sins, and all those who seek to live in peace with one another. And young children are welcome to participate in the discretion of their parents. Therefore, let us prepare ourselves to receive this holy sacrament by confessing and repenting of our sins in silence. I also want to say gluten-free is available for those who need it. Simply indicate that when you come up, and I'll be glad to help you. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Before the mountains were brought forth, or you had formed the earth, from everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life on the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Son, Jesus Christ, in whom you have revealed yourself, our light and our salvation. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed, and to announce the time had come when you would save your people. By the baptism of this suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take this, all of you, and drink it. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here 
and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever.
Would you please join me in the prayer after communion? Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Receive this benediction. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with you now and remain with you always. Let us go into the world to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Experiencing grace, exploring truth, expressing love. Amen.